Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series of podcasts that we call Menninger Mindscape. Um, it's great to have an old friend here today as our guest, uh, Dr. Michael DiAriano. Uh, Michael, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, it's great to see you again. Uh, Michael and I were both on the faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina a few years back, where he still is as professor of psychiatry and in the National Crime Victim Research and Treatment Center at what we call MUSC, Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, Michael is also director of the Mental Health Disparities and Diversity Program, and this was new to me. You're also the Associate Dean for Diversity at MUSC, uh, which is terrific, and I think that's a, is that a new role, or it's one you've just recently stepped into? So it's a relatively new role. I've been in that position for about a year and a half now. A year and a half. Really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have that position. It's important. Michael's done a lot of work in the Crime Victim Center and uh, at MUSC um, in the area of trauma, but particularly with children and not just all children, though all of them are part of many studies, but focusing in a special way on um, children of d diverse backgrounds, uh, under, un underrepresented diversity. Uh, and he's going to talk about that at our symposium tomorrow, which is um, our annual Menninger Symposium on Trauma. Not on trauma every year. This year it's on trauma. Uh, Michael's topic is a lot of words. It's trauma and trauma related sequelae among youth and families from ethnically and racially diverse backgrounds, which is an area of special interest of yours. Tell us a few headlines of what you're going to talk about. So, as you noted, most of my work has been focused on uh, working with traditionally underserved populations and um, really looking at the um, prevalence of trauma and the, the uh, trauma-related problems for all kids, but really looking at, in particular, for underserved populations, ethnic minorities, um, economically disadvantaged, uh, kids living in rural areas or living in inner city that experience um, particular challenges that might exacerbate their symptoms, might make it, might increase their risk for experiencing traumatic events, <clears throat> and might also make it more difficult for them to get help. So um, t tomorrow I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the general prevalence rates for uh, trauma exposure and um, kids in general, but then looking at how um, children from certain groups might be at greater risk for trauma exposure, trauma-related problems, and then unfortunately at great risk for not getting help. So there are a lot of barriers that kids experience. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing to try to get kids more help that normally wouldn't be able to come into the office or at least come into the office on a regular basis mm -hmm. and get therapy to uh, receive, uh, to get help for their PTSD symptoms. Um, so for example, doing home-based services, school-based services, uh, we provide services in churches, community-based organizations, and we're even providing some evidence-based trauma treatment through telehealth. So using, there you are. yeah, using HIPAA compliant um, equipment to provide to services to kids all over the state. Well, just add a little word about that. So when you do the telehealth um, to a rural, faraway place, where do the patients or the kids you're seeing tune in on the other end? So, so we've been doing it uh, through a, a variety of sites currently. At, um, at the sheriff's office, like so when folks uh, go to see the victim advocate, they can connect directly to us at a child advocacy center, at a rape crisis center, at a pediatric clinic, um, and we've also done it in several schools. Um, this, we just received a grant from the Duke Endowment to set up in Williamsburg County, which is a very poor underserved county in South Carolina, to, um, in collaboration with, with pediatrics, to be able to set up uh, sites, basically clinics, and there are virtual clinics mm -hmm. at all the schools within that county. And so we'll be able to, uh, the nurse can bring the child in and get pediatric care, but they, you know, for asthma, for cold, but they can also bring a child in to get assessed and evaluated for ADHD, for um, anxiety, for depression, for PTSD, um, and then get ongoing treatment, get ongoing uh, medication evaluation, monitoring. 
and all those different services we can provide through the, the telehealth equipment. Oh, that's terrific. Um, and you're using just video telehealth equipment into a health clinic that's general health. That's right. But you can then evaluate, of course, in psychiatry, you can evaluate patients long distance more easily, um, even the, almost the whole evaluation, although you've got to have people there to evaluate the medical side. Right. I'm sure that's an issue sometimes, too. Yeah, and so, and it's, so telehealth isn't appropriate for every single case, but it, it really is amazing <clears throat> how you can extend our reach so much more by providing services through telehealth. We're yeah. really able to, eat, to reach thousands of kids who you know, normally wouldn't get any services whatsoever, right. and we're able to get them the most cutting edge you know, evidence-based treatments for trauma and other types of problems. Yeah, we're, we're just expanding our outpatient capacity here and looking into developing a telehealth program because we think there are a lot of ways we could reach very far into underserved areas in the state of Texas. Texas is pretty low on the totem pole when it comes to per capita spending for mental health. And so a lot of people don't have access to very much at all in terms of mental health services. Absolutely, and it's an enormous state and you've got a lot of underserved populations in rural areas, but even in, in urban areas, a lot of kids could benefit from that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it must be multi-determined and kind of complicated because part of what you're trying to figure out how to address is really a, must be socioeconomic factors because you're dealing with people who don't have resources. Mm -hmm. But then in addition, access to care, independent of whether there are insurance companies or coverage is a separate problem and that may be differential depending upon the racial and ethnic background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of complexity I would think in trying to figure out how to put it together to get the care to the patient um, and to the family. How much um, family support do you get or how often do you encounter kind of fragmented families or even families who don't want you to help them because they don't want to see a shrink or have psychiatry in the room? So there's, there's lots of stigma associated with mental health care and it's really trying to get out there and explain to families that, you know, what the options are, what they can, what, you know, how we can help them, what, sometimes they don't know what they don't know and, and helping to figure out what their perceptions are of mental health care and try to meet them where they are is what we're trying to do and to try to engage them initially. Mm -hmm. The, the fun thing about providing outreach services and, and serving traditionally underserved is so we are, we're addressing things like, you know, barriers associated with finances. But we're also uh, addressing things like, you know, you have uh, two families that, that, two parents or one parent that works and they can't really bring their, mm -hmm. their child in for regular mental health care. You know, for therapy on a weekly basis, and, and you really need that continuity for a lot of these evidence-based treatments. And we try to take some of that burden off the, the family. Um, so if we can provide services to the child in the school, or, and then in, in addition to that, provide services to the parent at home. Mm -hmm. So for example, we're experimenting with uh, having uh, iPads taken to the home and then we can talk to the parent and do the, the, the parallel parent sessions with the parent at a time that's more convenient to them. It can be done in their, at their office. And it, it, so really trying to, to break out of those types of, this is the way that mental health care is provided in the office and you have to come here and you have to come here at this time yep. on a regular yep. basis. Yep. And trying to be a little bit more flexible so that we can reach you know, more of that iceberg. So because oh, our yeah, current yeah, services yeah. only reach a piece of it. Yeah, yeah, I think that is so cool. Um, I remember at MUSC, Scott Hengler and his group had developed multisystemic therapy, and one of the things that always struck me as so important about that was that it was outreach. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the patients or the families either come into the office or they don't get care. Right. They went and went to the homes, and even if it was not easy to do or in a bad neighborhood, they Absolutely. went to be there and found actually that it made a huge difference. You're doing that, sounds like, also but even going a step beyond because you're do, using new technology to do that. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, and you mentioned iPad, if you're using FaceTime and iPhone or if you're not mm -hmm. in May, and all of those are things so widespread out there in all populations now. Right. They're so easily accessible that people have them. Right. And that's new. Right, and, and we're using things that are very similar to like FaceTime, and, but we use ones that are, that are HIPAA compliant or that we know are HIPAA compliant and we have those assurances. 
and but you're but because they're so common, kids use this all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's an engagement strategy. Sure. So so kids are used to communicating through FaceTime or or using Skype. So basically, connecting up to a patient with Skype or rather with the, with the telehealth equipment. They're completely used to that, and it, it doesn't have the same type of, con a lot of therapists seem concerned that, oh, you have to be in person in order to establish this relationship. So, so research shows that the therapists are generally more concerned about that than the patients are. And really, that's the most important thing. If the patient feels that connection, they feel that that, yep. uh, that rapport is built, then we can do the work we need to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, a, it's their language. Absolutely. We, we're learning it, trying to. I'm not very good at it. But this is the way they communicate. They text each other. That's even old-fashioned now. There's so many other ways right. to do it. Uh, so I think that's really, really a... We have to take advantage of the new technology. We have to go where they are, which is really the principle you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to hear more about that tomorrow, I hope, um, in more detail and learn about the work that you're doing. I'm looking forward to it, but I'm glad to have a little preview today. Well, thanks. I'm looking forward to sharing some of these ideas and uh, looking forward to any questions that folks might have. Yeah, and I'm sure we will, but thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you all for joining us again, and we'll see you next time.